Thank you very much, Jim, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, the Irish Climate Science Forum for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, I'm not a published author in the area of methane metrics, but I've been taking a very close interest in it and reading the literature in detail for quite some time. So um, uh, it's um, a subject in which, which is extremely important to Ireland. And um, uh, it's at the moment uh, we're governed by EU regulations and how it's treated. Now, my presentation today is an extension of a submission I made on this topic to the EU uh, Commission in response to a call for submissions. My um, submission went in on the 5th of August. So today's talk is an extension of what I said in that submission. Um, my talk is, I see it as complementary to the presentation that was given uh, on the Irish Farmers Journal webinar last Friday where um, there were quite a number of speakers and the main scientific speaker was Professor Miles Allen, who is leader of the Oxford group uh, on this topic. Um, <clears throat> now, um, first of all, before I go into the talk, I want to make a declaration that I have no vested interests in this area. And I think it's very important for anybody talking about any aspect of climate science nowadays to be able to say they have no vested interests. Uh, I have been um, accused perhaps by some of um, being in the farming interest, working for the farming interest. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not actually from a farming background. I'm from Kilmore Quay, from a fishing background, although my grandparents were farmers on both sides. But uh, I speak as a scientist, and my primary concern here is with um, scientific accuracy and objectivity. Now, um, I started my scientific career um, as a graduate student under the guidance of Professor Jewel Charney at MIT. And um, Jewel was the lead author of the first report on carbon dioxide issued in 1979 called Carbon Dioxide and Climate, a Scientific Assessment. That was after I had graduated, but I remember distinctly uh, over 40 years ago, discussing this topic with Jewel. He was in the habit of um, talking to his, former, his students and former students about topics that were on his mind. And um, I remember a question he asked me over dinner do you think we're doing the right thing by putting out this report at this time? Uh, and I said, well, given that the models are all pre predicting a substantial warming, I think you are doing the right thing and you have to do it. Now, in the meantime, we've learned a lot about the limitations of models that we weren't aware of at that time. So I would say that um, I often wonder what Jewel would say if he were alive today. Anyway, I'll go on from there. The title of the talk is Methane Accounting in the EU and its Implications for Ireland. Uh, the topics uh, that I'll cover in brief will be uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane emissions, uh, global and Irish. There may be some in the audience who are not familiar with the chemical formula for carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4. So I will use these terms interchangeably in the talk. Now, um, greenhouse gas accounting systems. At the moment, um, there are three uh, very much um, in the forefront of discussion. Global warming potential, GWP. Global temperature potential, temperature change potential, GTP. And the system called GWP star developed by the Oxford group, Oxford based group uh, primarily. I'll also talk about the approaches of Van Weingarten and Happer. Uh, and I, I know that William Van Weingarten is in the audience. Greetings, William. And 
Uh, I'm not sure if w Will Happer is there, but if you are, Will, greetings also. And um, the uh, approach of Professor Frank Mitlerner, who spoke to the, um, at a, a meeting in Dublin earlier this year. And then the final topic will be climate sensitivity, which is my own research area, has been for some time. And I'll say a little bit about that at the end. Now, what are methane metrics? Methane metrics are designed to measure the climate impact of methane emissions relative to carbon dioxide emissions. Relevant factors that enter into this are the ratio of the instantaneous radiative forcings of the two gases. If you just add them and see what the instantaneous change uh, to the radiative balance is, that's the radiative forcing. That's an instantaneous or quasi instantaneous effect. Then there are different atmospheric residence times depending on um, their uh, chemical, the chemical reactions that happen, etc. Now, um, uh, carbon dioxide has a very long residence time, centuries to millennia, whereas methane has a short residence time, half-life of about 10 years. And the final uh, uh, relevant factor is their recent, their recent history, uh, emissions history of the two gases. That's, an, that's a, a relevant factor as well. Now, the global picture I'll talk about first, uh, data from Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, CO2 concentration trends and methane concentration trends. So let's, let's look at those. This is the graph of CO2 from Mauna Loa. And you can see it's been steadily rising. Um, now, the way the y-axis is um, designed here, it seems to be rising very fast. But actually, uh, if you plotted this with a different scale, it's not rising all that fast. It's doubling time. It's increasing at the rate of 2.3 parts per million per year on a base of 415. And that would give a doubling time of nearly two centuries. So it's not really increasing very fast. It's increasing steadily, yes, but it's not, uh, it, it's doubling time at the moment is quite long, really. Now, uh, has there been any measurable influence from the COVID-19 effects? Well, it's difficult to say at the moment. There's nothing too obvious uh, as a change yet there in that graph from the effects of the COVID-19 changes in the economic activity. Now, the methane concentration graph, um, this is not uh, as monotonically increasing as the carbon dioxide graph. Uh, you can see there, that there was a period uh, pointing at with my cursor here uh, between around the year 2000, before and after, when there was very little change at all in the methane con uh, content of the atmosphere. And we don't really understand why that's the case. Now, the, the concentration of methane is much smaller. Uh, its average increase is 0 0.0076 parts per million per year. And its doubling time at the moment is about 250 years. So it has a long, long doubling time given current trends. So carbon dioxide and methane concentration compared, and these are points that were pointed out uh, very uh, strongly by Van Weingarten, William, and uh, Will Happer. Uh, the ratio of CO2 to CH4 concentrations is 216. And the ratio of their growth rates is 303. So in round figures, CO2 has 200 times the concentration and 300 times the growth rate in molecules that CH4 has. So these are very important uh, background considerations, which we'll be, uh, come back to. Now, Ireland's relative position in the EU as a greenhouse gas emitter is currently based on using uh, the global warming potential metric, GWP100. That's global warming potential with a 100-year time horizon. And the value assigned to that is 25. That's a weighting factor for methane. Uh, so that every ton, uh, factor 25 here means that every ton of methane is multiplied by 25 
to give what's called a carbon dioxide equivalent in the GWP system, global warming potential system. Now, um, this uh, is somehow the figure, it shows Ireland uh, as, Ireland is actually the third highest emitter per capita in the EU, according to this graph. Uh, this graph uses the EU's uh, methane accounting system, uh, which, as I said, multiplies uh, a ton of methane by a factor of 25 to get a CO2 equivalent. So Ireland comes out as the third worst in the European Union uh, in this graph. This comes from the Central Statistics Office. And um, it, um, using the EU's uh, accounting system, Ireland looks like a very bad performer in the sense that our emissions per capita are the third worst in the European Union. Uh, and in the C Central Statistics Office report, Environmental Indicators Ireland 2020, um, it said Ireland had the third worst emissions of greenhouse gases per capita in the EU, EU at 13.3 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per capita. And Ireland's emissions were 55% higher than the EU 28 average of 8.6 tonnes. Now, this certainly makes Ireland uh, look like a laggard in um, its emissions situation. Um, the, a similar graph to this was presented to the Citizens Assembly in November 2017. Um, the topic of the Citizens Assembly discussions was uh, how the state can make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change. And this graph, at that time, Ireland was shown as the fourth worst uh, in terms of per capita emissions. And this was certainly a very influential graph in the context of the Citizens' Assembly. And um, you may remember that um, the Assembly made recommendations about the uh, agricultural emissions should be taxed, etc. Well, this graph was very influential in bringing about these recommendations. Now, um, agriculture as a percentage of national greenhouse gas emissions, this shows Ireland uh, as having um, agriculture being the highest contributor at over 30% of our total emissions, while the EU 27 average is just over 10%. Uh, so Ireland is, a, is a, an outlier here, um, but again, all this is based on the GWP accounting system. Um, agriculture is the main source of methane emissions in Ireland. According to the 2018 figures, agriculture contributed 92.8% of our methane emissions. Now, um, the EU's greenhouse gas emissions accounting system is based on this formula here. The annual emissions of various greenhouse gases are calculated as a carbon dioxide equivalent using E is equal to the sum of the emissions of the individual greenhouse gases multiplied by WI, the weighting factors. And the weighting factor for, um, for methane, as I mentioned already, is 25. That's the one that's used by the EU and hence by the EPA and the CSO. Um, and that figure 25 is taken from the IPCC report, the um, AR4 report 2007, that was the value given there. Uh, the value, figures have changed slightly uh, in the fifth assessment report. Now, every ton of methane then emitted is multiplied by 25 to obtain its carbon dioxide equivalent. And um, Ireland's carbon dioxide and methane emissions in 2018 the EPA's National Inventory Report 2020 gives the following figures here. Uh, the emissions of CO2 on its own, 38.8 uh, megatons in the year 2018. Um, then the emissions of uh, methane in terms of CO2 equivalent, 14 uh, million tons in the year 2018. 
But that was multiplied by 25. So the basic methane emission was 0 0.56 megaton in uh, 2018. So it's seen from this that whereas Ireland's unweighted CH4 emissions amounted to only 1.4% of our CO2 emissions, the country's GWP weighted CO2, CO2 equivalent methane emissions amounted to 36% of our CO2 emissions. And this is the main reason why Ireland appears as the third worst greenhouse gas emitter per capita in the European Union. It's basically due to the fact that methane, which is a relative, relatively big component of our emissions in European terms, is multiplied by 25 times for every ton emitted. Now, uh, a few words about the, what the global warming potential is. Uh, this is the definition from the IPCC's AR5 glossary. It's an index based on the radiative properties of greenhouse gases measuring the radiative forcing following a pulse emission of a unit mass of a given greenhouse gas in the present day atmosphere integrated over a chosen time horizon relative to that of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is the basic reference gas in all these um, uh, metrics. Now the GWP represents the combined effect of the differing times these gases remain in the atmosphere and their relative effectiveness in causing radiative forcing. In other words, the, uh, the radiative, instantaneous radiative forcing. Now, <clears throat> when you're talking about um, relationships between methane and um, carbon dioxide, you have to be very careful to specify whether you're speaking in terms of molecules, emissions measured in molecules, or emissions measured in tons. And um, there is a difference in the molecular weight of carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, carbon dioxide it has a molecular weight of 44, whereas methane has a molecular weight of 16. So one ton of emitted methane contains 44 over 16 times as many molecules as one ton of emitted carbon dioxide. So if we let our mol, uh, subscript mol, be the ratio of the radiated forcings of one molecule of added CO2 to one molecule of C, uh, CO2, and our mass be the corresponding ratio in terms of tons, then the relationship in the bottom line here holds that our mass is 44 over 16 times our molecular is 2.75 times the molecular ratio. And some, uh, some estimates of our model and our mass, uh, in the IPCC 2007 report, uh, our model, the ratio of the molecular forcings per molecule was 26.4, which meant that the R mass, the uh, ratio per ton of each gas was 72.6. In other words, a ton of um, um, a ton of um, methane is 72.6% uh, worse there, according to that. Uh, the corresponding figures from the 2013 IPCC report, uh, it's gone up a little bit and our mass is 72.9. The figure is given by Van Weingarten and Happer. Uh, there are two papers for reference in the list of references given in my slides. Anybody who is interested would be able to find them they give our mol the, is 30. So in other words, one molecule of added methane uh, gives 30 times the instantaneous radiative forcing of one molecule of added CO2 in the present day atmosphere. And that gives our mass is equal to 82.5. So um, then Barton and Packer um, results are based on very high resolution uh, radiative transfer calculations, much higher than anybody else has done, as far as I'm aware. And their, um, their results would be very rigorous in the sense that they're very high resolution calculations. Now, the influence of greenhouse gas lifetimes on GWPH. Uh, 
emitted, me emitted methane has a short lifetime in the atmosphere, decaying with a half-life of about 10 years, mainly due to the chemical process of hydroxyl oxidation. And this is in contrast to the emitted carbon dioxide, most of which remains in the atmosphere for centuries to millennia. So this is a very important difference between the two gases. Uh, for short-lived greenhouse gases such as methane, the global warming potential on the time horizon H decreases as the time horizon increases. So it's, it's a fairly strong function of the time horizon that you choose to look at. Now, uh, the IPCC's changed position on global warming potential, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, in its, um, the weighting factor of CH4 in 1990 to 2007, GWP as a greenhouse gas weighting factor has been discussed from the first assessment report, actually. This is, this is not a new concept, the global warming potential. The first assessment report in 1990 Discuss this um, global warming potential. In the fourth assessment report in 2007, the IPCC gave the following value. The global warming potential for CH4 uh, on a 100-year time frame is 25. And it's stated on page 11 that GWPs remain the recommended metric to compare future climate impacts of emissions of long-lived climate gases. So in 2007, the IPCC was clearly recommending the use of global warming potential. Now, uh, it's changed its position. In the fifth assessment report in 2013, the IPCC takes a much more qualified position in relation to GWP than the fourth assessment report. And I give some quotes here. On page 710, it states, it must be stressed there is no universally accepted methodology for combining all the relevant factors into a single global warming potential for greenhouse gas emissions. A simple approach has been adopted here to illustrate the difficulties inherent in the concept. And on page 711, it states there is no scientific argument for selecting a time horizon of 100 years compared with other choices. Then on uh, page uh, 714 presents a table which gives updated values for GWP100 as well as correspond corresponding values for a newer methane metric, the global temperature change potential GTP, due to Keith Shine at the University of Reading with co authors. And the GTP gives a, a smalling, smaller weighting factors for methane than the GWP. Uh, and on a 100 year time horizon, it gives a value as small as four. Uh, so the IPCC's fifth assessment report makes no recommendation as to which weighting factor should be used. This is a distinct difference from the previous report. Uh, I won't be saying too much about the global temperature change potential because this is a short uh, presentation just touching various topics, but uh, the global temperature change potential is regarded by some scientists as being a better metric than uh, GWP. Its values are smaller, the weighting factor it gives to methane are smaller than the GWP. So I won't go into that, it's a big topic. Now the GWP star approach to methane metrics, uh, this was the topic which was the main focus in the Irish Farmers Journal webinar uh, last Friday, as I mentioned. And GWP star formula for methane warming equivalent of methane emissions from uh, Miles Allen et al. and Lynch et al. Both papers in uh, Allen et al. was 2018, uh, 2018, Lynch et al. 2020. This is the formula here. This is the current most recent version of the GWP star formula. And the left hand side is the CO2 warming equivalent emissions on a time horizon H is equal to this, the right hand side here. And the right hand side involves E, which are the current value of methane emissions in megatons per year. It also involves DEDT, 
which is the rate of change of the emissions over the past 20 years, H is the time horizon, and GWPH is the global warming potential of methane for a time horizon H. And the, the, the quantities R and S, they're taken as 0 0.75 and 0 0.25 on the basis of experimentation with complex models. And uh, this choice gives a good approximation of the historical and projected warming impacts of methane over a range of emission trajectories. So if we put those values into the formula and use a finite difference approximation for DEDT, in other words, DEDT is taken as the current rate of emissions minus the rate of emissions 20 years ago divided by 20 years. If you take that finite difference approximation with H equal to 100 years and the most recent GWP 100, 28, from the IPC's fifth assessment report, the GWP star formula simplifies to this equation that you see at the bottom here. So according to this, to get the warming equivalent um, of a methane, a, a ton of methane in terms of its CO2, relative to CO2, you take the current methane emissions multiplied by 112 and the emissions 20 years ago multiplied by 105. And that gives you your warming equivalent emissions. And this is the basic GWP star formula in simplified form. So let's put Irish figures into that formula. Data for Irish agricultural emissions for 1998 to 2018 are available from the EPA's National Inventory Report 2020, page 55. And there it can be seen that uh, agricultural methane emissions in 2018 were 0 0.5188 megaton in that year. And in 1998, the corresponding figure was 0 0.5477. So the emissions were greater in 1998 than they were in 2018. And if we put those values into the GWP star simplified formula, this is what we get for the um, CO2 equivalent methane emissions, agricultural methane emissions. So this indicates that Irish agricultural methane emissions contributed to, to global warming in 2018, but by an amount that was very small compared with that calculated using the GWP 100 metric, which as I pointed out earlier, was 14 megatons in the year. So now we're comparing uh, a little over it's 0.6 megaton approximately with 14 megaton calculated according to the different formulas. So obviously this is a huge difference. Instead of regarding methane emissions as 14 megatons, they're now calculated as 0.597 megatons in 2018. Now, um, Another way of looking at the methane emissions, instead of using a finite difference formula between the current year going back to 1998, you can do a regression curve, a statistical regression curve, a best fit curve to the data. And these data are from the EPA uh, reports. And uh, the best fit uh, in terms of a regression, line of regression, the red dotted line here, dashed line, it gives this formula here. Uh, so it's actually decreasing over that whole period, but the trend, the EDT is different as given by the regression line from what's given by the finite difference formula. And from the regression line, the trend, the EDT is this value here, minus 0 0.0024 megatons per year per year. And if you put that value into the GWP star formula, you get a somewhat different result, not terribly different, they're both small, but now instead of being small and positive, it's gone to small and negative. So according to this, in 2018, Irish agricultural methane emissions made a cooling contribution to the global climate system, equivalent to the removal of atmospheric CO2 at the rate of 1.4 megatons per year. 
This is what comes out of the GWP star formula using Irish methane data. Now the approaches of uh, Van Weingarten and Happer and uh, Mittlerner. Uh, in their uh, papers published earlier this year, William Van Weingarten and Will Happer uh, concluded as follows. Uh, for current concentrations of greenhouse gases, the radiative force against the tropopause per added methane molecule is about 30 times larger than the corresponding forcing per added CO2 molecule. So they fully recognize methane is a powerful greenhouse gas in terms of, it, of instantaneous radiative forcing. It's 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in the current atmosphere. But the rate of increase of CH4 molecules is more than 300 times smaller than the rate of increase of CO2 molecules. So the contribution of methane to the annual increase in forcing is less than a tenth that of carbon dioxide. In other words, it's 30 over 300. They're using the uh, 30 times larger, but 30 300 times smaller in terms of emissions rates. So um, this, uh, Van Weingarten and Happer then conclude that proposals to place harsh restrictions on methane are unjustified. Now you'll notice that their argument includes recent trends in both methane and carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, the contribution of ruminant methane to the annual increase in forcing is even less than one tenth that of carbon dioxide. And the question is, what is its contribution? Well, to answer this, I went back to the IPCC uh, 2013 report. There's a table on page 507 that gives the figures needed. Uh, the total sources um, of methane in the period 2000 to 2009 uh, are 678 megaton per year. This is the uh, representative value. Natural sources 51%, anthropogenic 49%. A partial breakdown of the anthropogenic sources shows that fossil fuels account for about 14% of the total methane sources and ruminants account for about 13% of the total methane sources worldwide. So then, uh, if we use the above figures, the contribution of ruminant methane to atmospheric forcing is only 13% of one tenth. In other words, it's one over 77th that of CO2. So uh, this is quite a lot smaller. Now, Professor Frank Mittlerner, the University of California, Davis, who was also invited to Dublin uh, by the, um, the IFA uh, earlier this year, stressed that the CO2 added to the atmosphere when ruminant methane decays is not new to the atmosphere, but merely recycled. Um, cows eat grass. The grass take CO2 from the atmosphere. The cows emit methane. That methane gets converted back to CO2, and it goes back to replace what was drawn down earlier by the growing grass. So it's not new to the atmosphere. It's just being recycled. So this is in contrast to the CO2 added by the decay of methane from sources such as fossil fuel extraction, which is new to the atmosphere. So if this is taken into account, the global contribution of ruminant methane to atmospheric forcing is even less than one over 77th that of CO2. Now, finally, just a brief word on climate sensitivity. Uh, methane metrics measure the climate impact of methane relative to carbon dioxide. The bigger question is how large is the climate impact of carbon dioxide itself? This depends on climate sensitivity, which is formally defined as the equilibrium global warming resulting from a doubling of carbon dioxide. Now, low climate sensitivity implies reduced urgency, gives us more time uh, to reduce CO2 emissions if they're posing a danger, whereas high climate sensitivity implies increased urgency in doing so.
Much observational evidence indicates low climate sensitivity, uh, including my own uh, paper in um, Earth and Space Science in 2016. I use satellite data with a simple um, energy balance model and got a low climate sensitivity value. Now, most of the evidence for high climate sensitivity comes from climate models, but um, uh, these models don't agree with the satellite observations of radiative response of the Earth in the tropics, uh, which is very much larger than the models are simulating. So this slide is um, taken from a presentation to the US House of Representatives Committee on Space Science and Technology by Patrick Michaels. And he gives the various uh, estimates of climate sensitivity. At the very top here, we see the IPCC uh, AR5 models, which uh, give an estimate. They say the likely range lies between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. And um, there, there's a possible even bigger range if you include the outliers. Uh, my value was included here in this presentation by Professor uh, Patrick Michaels. And my value was about one uh, degree for doubling of CO2. And that was very, I, I used the data, satellite data, which was uh, processed by Linsman and Choi. I used their processed data for the satellite data and their values um, were backed up by a completely independent study by a German paper by uh, Mauritsen and Stevens. And uh, the, sa the satellite data that I used then were a combination of what uh, came from the Lindsman Choi paper and what came from the Mauritsen and Stevens paper. And I got a one degree climate sensitivity. So then the, the values lie all over the place, really. When you look at this graph as a whole, uh, equilibrium clim climate sensitivity is something whose value uh, has a lot of different estimates attached to it. So that's really uh, brings me to the conclusions. Um, the EU's current accounting system for greenhouse gases based on using global warming potential 100 as a weighting factor places Ireland in a very unfavorable position, mainly because the weighting factor of 25 for methane it results in Ireland being portrayed as the third worst emitter of greenhouse gases per capita in the European Union. This is entirely a result of the use of the global warming potential metric to give that picture. It would be very different if we use different metrics. Now, the IPCC formerly recommended the use of GWP as a weighting factor, factor but no longer does so. Recent scientific developments, which I've touched on, suggest that Ireland's methane emissions in the past 20 years have contributed negligibly to, negligibly to global warming or have even contributed to global cooling. And it's important that the EU take recent scientific developments on methane impacts fully into account in taking political decisions relating to methane emissions. Then I give the references and that's the end. Thank you very much for your attention.